everyone, and welcome to another uh, episode of Real Atheology, a Philosophy of Religion podcast. Um, I'm your host, Ben Watkins, and my co-hosts... Ben Naver and, and John Lopolato. Okay, and today we're going to be discussing uh, Ed Fieser and a particular argument from his book, The Five Proofs of the Existence of God. And so this is the argument from motion or Aristotelian argument or argument from change, as some people have uh, have called it. Mm -hmm. And so basically in this argument, uh, well, so so what do you all think? This is a cosmological argument. Um, uh, how relevant is this argument in the philosophy of religion today? Because I don't I don't see it come up that often. Do what is y'all's experience? Well, I mean, the Thomistic arguments that Ed Fazer likes to present are not the stock standard fare you get um, from most internet apologists, I think. Um, and they're sort of, the Thomists are sort of their own little breed. Um, so I guess we should uh, explain at this point that uh, Thomism is the philosophy of St. Thomas Aquinas, and he has what are called um, his five ways. And these are basically just five different arguments that he thinks um, count in favor of us believing that God exists. Yes. And so this is just one of them. Right. But the book, Five Proofs of the Existence of God, it, it doesn't exactly correspond to the five ways. Um, some of the five proofs that he gives are basically the same argument or an updated version of an argument that Aquinas made in his five ways. Mm -hmm. But um, they're not exactly the same. It's not the same list of arguments. Right. Sure. Uh, but this argument in particular is yeah. based on Thomism, which is the metaphysic of St. Thomas Aquinas. Yes. So the argument for motion, that is, I believe, the first way. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. It, well, and it's built on the uh, Aristotle's metaphysics. So, uh, Fieser, even when he first starts presenting this argument, I mean, he jumps right in with the notion of uh, actualizing a potential, which is anyone who's read Aristotle is familiar. This is um, concepts straight from Aristotle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, this uh, is. Um, yeah, so what you might heard this refer to as as uh, neo Aristotelian metaphysics, but but this will fit right within a general cosmological argument. So this isn't its own class of argument. I mean this this fits right in with the family of cosmological arguments, which say that there's you know some sort of fact about the cosmos and in this case that there's change happening or that there's motion and then there's some it tries to introduce some general principle which which applies to the universe um and implies that there must be you know some explanation or some cause um yeah. of it and so and there and, is a principle like this in this argument, namely, change requires a changer or a potential must be actualized by some actualizer. Exactly. Exactly. So that would be so. And it, the, the point is to be able to combine this cosmological fact and this cosmological principle um, such that um, it has to be caused by something other than itself, something that can't be infinite and something that must be a necessary being. And so then, you know, uh, Thomas Aquinas famously says, and all know this to be God. Right. Is that, have I, have I characterized this argument fairly? I think yeah. so. Um, That's you, kind of the rough and dirty, uh, right. formal version. There are 50, of, well, there are 49 premises and one conclusion <laughs> of course, <laughs> in this, in this argument. So it's very long. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, details to cover. Yes, a ton of, and we're, we, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of the details, at least in any way that's, you know, adequate for each of them. But we can certainly talk about it, at least in a, in a general sense here, because what this argument is built on is, again, Aristotelian metaphysics. So this argument is going to rise or fall on the, the robustness of one, the Aristotelian metaphysics, and two, 
how well we can make the jump from prime mover or first cause to the god of classical theism. So to me, those are the two really big, big things that this argument has to overcome because I, th I think the presumption against these arguments is, is that look, these, these aren't, these, these premises don't entail a perfect being, which is what perfect being monotheism would be committed to. And this argument is built on contentious metaphysics. Mm -hmm. So I think anyone who puts forward this sort of argument has to address those two things. Like if you're, j if you just leave that out of the discussion, then I think you've just, it's an incomplete discussion. <laughs> Yeah, although I think we should be a little careful to distinguish between uh, the god of classical theists and Thomas and the god of perfect being theology or perfect being theism. I think Thomas usually want to distance themselves from that tradition, theistic That's tradition. That's a great point. That's uh -huh. a great point. Um, but nevertheless, they think that God is perfect in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, they just have their, their own way of cashing it out. Can you uh, explain a little bit more this distinction between the because there's a there's a debate amongst theists, the Thomists and then the theistic personalists. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Can you what, what are your thoughts on that, Ben? Yeah. So one of the distinctions is kind of uh, worn on the sleeves of those terms because um, there's there's classical theism and theistic personalism. The, um, an obvious distinction is that theistic personalists believe that God is a person or personal and classical theists do not. Um, and in fact, usually they say God is not even a particular being. He is being itself or he is the ground of being. Yes. And, um, they have a doctrine. It's called divine simplicity, which yeah. uh, now obviously this is a very contentious, you know, there's, a lot of it, it's very it's like naturalism it's tough to pin down exactly what the doctrine of design simplicity is mm -hmm. um but they're trying to say things are Thomists I should say are trying to say you know that God isn't even the kind of thing that we would ascribe properties to it's the kind of thing that would need to be in place prior to before to, for any properties to be instantiated yeah so, or maybe God has properties but they're all the same property yeah he's perfectly simple yes yeah. uh, the, there's nothing that could be simpler than god the, mm -hmm. the 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 notion that you could have something simpler than god would not make any sense mm -hmm. right so one of the things that always struck me as odd is that well when we're talking about Aquinas, we're generally talking about Catholics. So these are still generally Christians. We're calling them classical theists. Um, but uh, Aquinas is the official philosopher of the Catholic Church, and these are uh, very much Catholic-held uh, doctrines. And so there's still Christians who believe in a personal God that, with three parts, a trinity, one of whom is Jesus, um, who very much was a person. Uh, so I'm not sure how they square those two things of being itself and then going into the specifics of Christian doctrine. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, so I was not raised Catholic, so it, that was not a tension that I had to face head on, so right. to speak. So um, it, there's work to be done there, I suppose, is what I mean. I'm, I'm oh, sure, sure. There, this has been worked out and there is some principles that they will appeal to but it definitely almost at the surface level seems to contradict what you guys are saying in terms of you know it, god not being a personal being but being the ground of all being but then at the same time affirming a trinity and a personal god well so i will say that i think that this is where the theistic personalists have the upper hand in their god concept um because it's something that responds to the religious concerns that we would have. So it's saying that there's this being that loves us, has intentions and beliefs and that we can have a relationship with, whereas the Thomists have to kind of back away from that model. And so I think there's certainly a tension there that, that, that John's pointing to because, and I've, I've been criticized for making this comment before, but in a way, Thomism is watered down theism mm 
because they don't have this content that the theistic personalists seem to have and so, seem to be okay putting in their model. And so this Thomistic model kind of has this, that God is seen as this abstract necessary foundation of being. Well, it's not so clear that that uh, are religious concerns. Does that make sense? Yeah, but to be fair, um, Thomas do think that we can ascribe some of the properties that we would, that perfect being theists describe to God, to God, but in an in a logical sense. Um, so not in the same sense that they, we would attribute them to, say, a human. Um, we would attribute the property of being loving to some humans. And if we're going to attribute that to God as well, it's going to have to be in a different sense. But it's still analogous um, to the sense in which we apply it to humans. Mm -hmm. Relevantly analogous in, mm -hmm. in such a way that we could understand, like, God's love could make sense to us. Perhaps not completely, but yeah, I think yeah. they, they want to say we have some Because they don't want to say it's, it's completely ineffable or incomprehensible. They don't mm -hmm. want to say that. Yeah, not generally. No. Yeah. Okay, cool. So what, where do, where do y'all per particularly see the weaknesses of this argument? I've, I've pointed to, to two obvious weaknesses that I see that the Aristotelian metaphysics and then what I've called the gap problem, getting from this conclusion to a perfect being monotheism, however we want to cash that out. Do y'all object to the cosmological fact of, you know, that there is change in the universe or to the principle that, you know, change requires a changer? Well, I would, so I think the, the in, inside of the Aristotelian metaphysic, I think the argument is just fine. I do have a problem with the metaphysic itself and some of the assumptions it makes. And that's, that's where my objections uh, kind of start to center around. Um, specifically, like... When you were presented with this, it seems kind of weird these days. But if you look at the world, try to look at the world the way Aristotle looked at the world, right? Uh, Ed, Ed Fazer begins the presentation of this talking about uh, like a ball on a table. And so by looking at the ball, the ball is static. And that in order for it to move, it requires something to act upon it, to actualize the change, to actualize the potential, right? Um, and this, you know, from a pre-scientific era, this seems very intuitive, common sense, straightforward, right? Something has to act on something else to cause a change in that thing. Well, so that's a linear causal chain. He, right. he distinguishes between the linear causal chain and then the hierarchy, uh, hierarchical uh, approach, uh, right? Right. And then... Uh, I, I would like to get to that because it, that's an important distinction, but he does base it, he bases that on the idea the intuitive appeal is on the linear series, right? He he still believes that in either case there has to be um, you're talking about the actualization of a potential, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that jives with a intuitive experience of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so my first kind of bone to pick with the argument is that given a modern scientific understanding, you might look at a ball on a table and think that it is static, but we know it's made up of things called atoms. And in those atoms, there are electrons that are undergoing change around a nucleus at all times, right? We might not be able to perceive it with our naked eyes, but we know it's happening. Right, so the, well, we know that a ball is mostly empty space. Right, so there is something, there is change already happening with seemingly nothing acting on the ball itself to actualize that change. Mm -hmm. Now, this there's is there's gravitational forces acting on it in many different ways. You know, we're on a planet spinning through galaxies in multiple different ways. You know, so this. The ball is static relative to some point of view. Right. I guess my example or what I'm what I'm really talking about is the excitation of the electrons around the atom. Mm 
right? And the fact oh, that so, there is yes, charge and spin, those yeah. sorts of things going on all the time. And seemingly that's just a thing that they do. It is a property of the field itself is that it is always undergoing this kind of change. Right. So to say that there must be something that actualizes that um, is, is not exactly this intuitive, straightforward uh, kind of you don't have the same intuitive appeal that you would get at the macro level of, say, acting on a ball to make it move. So maybe maybe this is a good point for us to take a second and um, clarify this actualized uh, potentiality type lingo that we're using. We're saying that there's so to, that 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 it, if there's change going on, what's happening is that something has a potential in it. So this ball has the pot a potential to be thrown through the air, and so what makes that change happen of throwing this ball through the air is the actualization of throwing the ball through the, through the air. Someone has to actualize that act. And so mm -hmm. if you take this all the way down to the beginning of the universe and you say that all this change is there, you have to have something that itself is a necessary actualizer. It was not actualized from some previous potential can't in principle have any potential right um and way of saying it. yes the the more precise term i think that thomas used uh, instead of potential is passive potency um and that is the ability to be affected it, it doesn't include causal powers because those are abilities to affect things but rather passive potency is the ability to be affected by something, maybe itself or something else. Um, Can you give a specific example just out of curiosity? Yeah, so for example, the molecules in a cup of coffee um, have the ability to become, to move more slowly, in which case the coffee becomes colder, right? Yes. Um, uh, and so that could be actualized by the surrounding molecules in the air or the, the cup. Um, because they're not moving as quickly as the hot coffee molecules, right? Um, yeah. And there are collisions going on. Right. So yeah. what we're talking about here, what, what Ben alluded to earlier, was a, a series of linear causes, right? So you have a, a hot coffee, and it is affected by the air, which was... You know, the mm -hmm. air is cooler because I decided to turn on an air conditioner, which in turn cools the air, which in turn cools the coffee, etc., etc., etc. And this could go back, in principle for the argument, this is not to be confused with a uh, Kalam-style cosmological argument. In principle, for this argument, the universe could have in existed for an infinite amount of time, right? Mm -hmm. This does not rely on there being a beginning to the universe, right? And so this, in this way, the argument is a bit more robust than something like the Kalam. Uh, so what uh, Pfizer gets into here, or Phaser, excuse me, is he talks about what Ben mentioned earlier, which is a hierarchical cause. So to continue with the example of a coffee cup, let's presume the coffee cup is three feet above the floor. And this is being actualized by a table, which is then resting on the floor, which is held up by the foundation of the house, which is then in turn held up by the earth. Right? So... It is at, at, at any at even at the same moment, there is sort of like a hierarchy here in that the coffee cup depends on the table, which depends on the foundation, which depends on the earth. Right. And the earth would be, in at least in this example, a kind of first member in the hierarchical series. And so if we're, the earth were to blow up, the coffee cup will no longer be three feet above the floor. Right. Mm -hmm. if, if there was an earthquake or something, if the if the, the the house collapsed and the table fell down, then the the potential of the coffee cup to be only three feet above the ground is no longer being actualized. Mm -hmm. And so we naturally want to 
ex extrapolate this to God and say that God is this necessary ground of being that in, in the hierarchical series, which holds everything up. And so if you were to remove God from the picture, everything else would go as well. Just like if we remove the earth, the, the coffee would no longer, would, no longer be there right i'm not sure if that's exactly what phaser wants to get at though because i think he wants us to focus on a certain type of hierarchical series of causes uh namely a hierarchical series of where each of the members actualizes the next member's potential to exist um so that's slightly different from the potential to be held up like in the hierarchical series we were talking about before. Okay. Um, yes. And what he wants to say, Phaser wants to say that this specific type of hierarchical series um, that has to do with the actualization of existence has to terminate with a purely actual actualizer and or an unmoved mover. Um, okay. And maybe these other types of hierarchical series do not have to terminate with that kind of thing. For example, uh, the, the series of things that are being held up might just terminate with the Earth, because in what sense does the Earth need to be held up? Doesn't need anything to help hold it up. Is it held up in any sense? Doesn't seem to make sense that it's held up. Right. So, in this sense, if you were to look at it hierarchically, you you might almost be able to say that if we were to file 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 follow the hierarchy of causes we might say well maybe it terminates all the way down into say the base whatever the base state of matter energy is right that is the the final thing in this hierarchy of causes that are sustaining everything that we generally experience but obviously that's not what Pfizer has in mind so he introduces um the what what you talked about earlier in terms of what causes the existence of a thing. Um, uh, if you're okay with it, I could uh, read a little bit from the from his book that I think is relevant. Sure. All right. All right so this is on pages 26 to 27. Um, he was talking about in context uh, the water in the coffee. Um, and so what he says is, what we're asking about, again, is what keeps the water in existence at any instant at which it does, in fact, exist. You might say that it has to do with chemical bonding between atoms, but that merely rephrases rather than answers the question. For the atoms have the potential to be bonded in other ways, and yet they are not so bonded. It is their potential to be bonded in such a way that the water results that is in fact being actualized again why appealing to the structure of the atom won't answer the question either it merely pushes it back a stage for why are the subatomic particles combined in this in just the specific way that they are here and now rather than some other way what actualizes that potential rather than another and what he goes on to say is what we have here is as you have noticed is something like the cup is held up which like held up by the desk which is held up by the floor only in this case it is the very existence of a thing that is at issue rather than it's merely its particular location the potential of the coffee to exist here and now is actualized in part by the existence of the water which in turn only exists because of the certain potential of the atoms is being actualized where these atoms themselves exist only because a certain potential of the subatomic particles is being actualized. This is a hierarchical series, one in which, as we have seen, must have a first member. So there's a lot there, but I think the key point here is that when he's talking about a potential, he's talking about, it seems like, something being contingent. Right? He talks about, well, why are the subatomic particles arranged in this way rather than another? So mm -hmm. in order for something to be having a potential, it must be contingent. Right? And so that's how he gets to God being a necessary being, there being pure actuality itself, um, it avoids the problem of needing an actualizer.
Because I think by definition, potentials are unactualized. So um, they can be actually the case because there's some potential for them to be the case. But um, there's since they're unactualized, there's also the possibility that they're not the case or not actualized. So, yeah, they're contingent. It's neither necessary or impossible for them to be actual. Right. So I think what happens here is that this almost, it feels like to me that this boils down to kind of like an argument from contingency, right? So we started out with motion, um, and then he, from there, he derives a hierarchical series, and then instead, for the hierarchical series, he boils a potential down to basically contingency. And so if we can answer the argument from contingency, then we would basically subvert this argument, or so my reasoning goes. Do you guys agree? I don't know, because the argument from contingency is just another variation of cosmological argument. So I certainly see these arguments as parallel and definitely analogous in certain ways, but this argument doesn't seem to be appealing to a principle of sufficient reason. So that's why I'm hesitant to to agree with you on this, because it, it seems like, but I, I do get what you're saying with it being contingent, because we're saying that if something is potential, it could, it could have all different sorts of potentiality. So here's the thing. So the quote is, for why are the particles combined in just the specific way they are here and now rather than some other way? And so when he asks that question or he, he says, what is it that actualizes that potential rather than another? Yeah, that, right? that, question that about seems opinion. like the potential uh, PSR, the principle of sufficient reason. He's asking for an explanation of why a contingent thing exists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Yeah, the principle is change requires a changer, which is to say, whenever a potential is actualized, there's an actualizer of that potential. Mm -hmm. And that's just another way of saying that there's something explaining um, the actualization of the potential. Yeah. There's but a sufficient reason for the actualization of the potential. Every potential yeah. has a sufficient reason for yes. its actualization. Yeah. And oh, so. That's hard to say. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> if you're skeptical of the PSR, why would you agree with that? Why couldn't we think, oh, this potential just actualized on its own? Right. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Unexpl um, completely unexplained. Yeah. And that's, yeah, I'm not even saying it explained its own actualization. I'm just saying, oh, it actualized. It has yeah. no explanation. It so, actual. right. I, so, my, my preferred way of responding to the PSR. And what I would just say here is just a brute fact that matter energy exists and it has the properties that it does. Um, like right now it would be best described by um, uh, quantum field theory, I think is the, the most base uh, scientific description of the behavior of matter or matter energy, I suppose. Um, and it just, why does it have that description vice another uh, description that we could conceive of well there is no explanation it's just brute mm -hmm. and um, I think here I think it, it's it's important to point out that um, the theists like to say that they they believe their God is necessary right that there are no brute facts but if you're a Christian specifically it most assuredly seems that there is at least one brute fact about their God, namely that it's a trinity rather than, say, a quintuple or a duet or a single. Create something rather than nothing. Excuse me? That they can, that they, so God chose to create a world, but he could have chosen not to create a world. So it is a contingent brute fact that God chose to create the world. Well, perhaps he had a good reason to create the world, and maybe that even follows from his maximal maximal greatness that he... That sure. he so maybe there is an explanation yeah. for why yeah. the world exists, vice not, but I don't think you can say that there is some explanation for why he's a trinity rather than some other number of whatever the properties of the trinity happen to be. And I think even if you were to try to come up with some metaphysical principle to explain, like, say, the nature of personhood, um, 
you would come up with some principle that necessitate, necessitates it has three parts. Um, you could ask, well, why that principle would itself be a brute fact of metaphysics, right? There's no way to ultimately justify that rule. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be some kind of brute fact, even on at least, let's say, Christian theism. Um, it may well be the case that in, even on generic theism, given whatever theological positions you hold, there might be more brute facts. Um, but at least for Christians, this one seems to remain. And so I don't think it's particularly damaging to atheism to just say, hey, it's a brute fact that, you know, matter energy exists and it has these properties. The end. Uh, another really important point, I think, is that Phaser's fifth proof, or the rationalist proof, is supposed to be an argument in favor of the PSR. And these five proofs are supposed to be independent uh, pieces of evidence or demonstrations of the existence of God um, in, in his sense of God. And uh, if that's so, then why is he allowed to assume, presuppose, the PSR that he's proving in his fifth proof in the first proof? Um, the argument for motion. I guess he doesn't see it as the PSR being essential to it because he, he's just appealing to this concept of change and that that concept just doesn't have the PSR as yeah. an essential component of it. That's the only thing I can think of. Right. Yeah, and he, he, he true, gets into presuppose the PSR even if he denies it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, people want to say that the Kalam cosmological argument and the argument from contingency are two independent arguments from one another, but they're both cosmological arguments. So I guess there's, there's, it depends on how we're framing, you know, our labels here. You see what I'm saying? Right. Um, I think the key point is. Even in this case, we could just say that it's just a brute fact as to why something uh, or, you know, why why does, say, the atoms happen to be in, in this way or why does uh, matter energy happen to have the properties that it does and it's just say, well, it's a brute, it's a brute fact. The, I, although fundamentally, I think what, we would get at here is we disagreeing with the notion of change being the actualization of potential right? there are other metaphysical accounts of change which wouldn't fall into that paradigm which would then basically subvert this argument well yeah so that was my original the, one of the two things that i mentioned it's it requires this aristotelian notion of actualizing the potential and so this is a contentious metaphysics and so if the this argument is only as strong as the metaphysics that's underlying it. If the metaphysics in it is mistaken, or there is a better metaphysics, um, then, you know, this just becomes an obsolete argument in the way, you know, it just got replaced by Newton, and then Newton got replaced by Einstein. You know, you see what I mean? Like, it's just, it was, it was the best we could do with the conceptual tools we had at the time, but now we've got better conceptual tools and we've moved on. Right. Although I think it is very important to point out that we're still talking about metaphysics. And so what's decontextualized or what we're not seeing in the, our discussion or Pfizer's presentation was that when St. Thomas Aquinas or, or Aristotle put this kind of argument forward, there was a lot of extra pieces to it that were disproven later on, by, like you say, by Newton, by Einstein. But we're talking about Neo-Aristotelianism and uh, Neo-Thomism, or Thomism, generally speaking. Um, sure. it, it has gone through 2,000 years of revision, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's metaphysics. You can abstract out the parts that are falsifiable and make the neo Aristotelianism is such a metaphysical type claim or the claims it makes are the kind such that science can't really disprove it. Right. And Pfizer it's does spend. 
they're going to they, they're going to say that it's necessary for science. So it's not that right. science undermines Aristotelian metaphysics. It's that you something like Aristotelian metaphysics must be true to even have an enterprise called science. Yes, that is an argument I believe he makes yeah. in um, he makes that argument in a very, in a different book of his. But yes, yes, the idea is that he's going to make it such. Like, he does spend a good amount of time, even in this book, talking about supposed refutations of the metaphysic by Newton and Einstein. And he gives a good presentation as to how Neo-Aristotelians basically can rework their principles around the latest discoveries done by Newton, Einstein, etc. in science. But well, Fazer might respond here, even though he's reworked the principles of Thomism um, so that they are consistent and not falsifiable, falsified by science. They might still be falsifiable by some conceivable uh, observations, right? That we just haven't made yet. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps I'm I'm particularly pessimistic about. <laughs> metaphysics being falsifiable i think by nature it isn't and th even if it was it would just be neo neo aristotelianism that would then just get worked around again I well think. but aren't we so saying I that aren't we saying the original metaphysic was falsified isn't that why you're saying you had to rework it in the first place right there were additional there there were there were parts of it that ended up could be falsified but then you can always abstract it back another level right mm -hmm. so there's always a way to kind of retain the general principle right without the particulars that were falsifiable right so how can i put this i guess the point here is that there are other metaphysical systems that could be used so we're not necessarily like there's nothing to show that we need scholastic uh, metaphysics or neo-aristotelianism in order for science to take hold right well so so that's that's an that's the claim that i think we should now take some time because because what are the alternatives like we're saying that like okay well mm -hmm. we don't need to accept this aristotelian metaphysic what is the alternative yeah and i think that's going to be hard to specify because aren't these concepts that thomas used to explain change in motion so broad that they can uh, you can say that other accounts are subsumed under this account. Yeah. It, well, and so that's part of their, that that's what they believe is the strength of their view. Is yeah. that it's so uh, much like how we can use the concept of a reason very broadly to say that we can have reasons for belief and reasons for action and all that, you know, you can use it in a very wide range of different ways of explaining like what is a the potential there could be so many different particular things that you think it is mm -hmm. um and you might identify it with something physical and it could be a variety of different physical things well so what originally mm -hmm. displaced this aristotelian metaphysic was thinkers like galileo who were uh, and descartes who were coming up with just different ways of inquiry so for example galileo wants to strip away all of the first person um aspects of a phenomena so that we're left all we're left with is this third per, you know third person facts and third person understanding that is available to everyone so it's 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 the picture in which we started asking questions that changed, right, mm -hmm. within the Enlightenment period. And so the, Thoma the, the, the Thomists now want to say, no, we should have never abandoned this Aristotelian framework. The, th this is a way in which the Enlightenment has, has you know, done us harm because we've taken on this wrong way of looking at the world. I, I, I can't remember who it was, but it was one Thomist saying, you know, within a Thomist model of understanding the world, a the hard problem of consciousness just doesn't even arise, which I thought was incredible. I was like, that can't that can't possibly be right. But they, that was one of the ways in which they were trying to argue that the Thomistic view 
was superior is because it doesn't it doesn't give rise to all these other problems like the hard problem of consciousness. Yeah, that seems absurd. I would need them to cash that out. <laughs> yeah. Pretty so I, I remember I remember, you know, kind of shaking my head going, blah, blah, blah. what? <laughs> I think uh, one of the things that I'm trying to remember the specific book where I read it, but um, one of the things that re did replace the Thomistic account was like the idea of metaphysics in in that you're deriving these very fundamental you're driving at the fundamental nature of reality whereas say a Kantian view of metaphysics would be that it's just the way our human minds are interpreting the world it's a much more pessimistic view and so they just the Thomists just reject that they go no it must be this fundamental thing but there's no way to prove one way or the other which view is is correct right so if you just take a Kantian view of metaphysics then you know you're you're avoiding this problem altogether okay well man we <laughs> that's some we got into some deep stuff here um so where do we where, where do we want to take this convert what direction do we want to take this conversation in now yeah. Um, cause I'd like mm -hmm. to push it towards, uh, the gap problem because that's something that we haven't dis discussed a whole lot yet. Sure. And so the gap problem is what I mentioned earlier in that, let's say that we accept this argument entirely and we accept the conclusion and we say, yes, there is this unmoved mover. A purely actual actualizer. Exactly. And so we, we accept that conclusion. We then say, okay, is this conclusion of religious significance? Can we get, you know, an, an, an infinitely powerful and perfectly good being from this conclusion? And it seems like, no, you can't get that, that there's this gap between this conclusion and what the object would be would have to be to respond to our religious concerns, which would be a, a, a perfect be. And so if we put this, I, I think this is a problem simply because if you put this up with the competing argument, like uh, an argument from evil or an argument from divine hiddenness, this argument cannot even in principle undercut one of those arguments. The, the argument from divine hiddenness or an argument from evil could concede this argument in its entirety and say, look, the, the unmoved mover that, that exists is completely indifferent to human affairs. So you'd be left with like a deistic God rather yeah. than the Christian God. Yes. A, a tinkering watch waker type God. Mm -hmm. Right. I believe uh, when Pfizer goes through that in the book, he starts appealing to a number of other uh, Thomistic assumptions about what perfection would be and what goodness would be. Uh, I think goodness becomes equi equivalent to being itself. And of course, uh, if this is a purely actual actualizer, then it is pure being, as we mentioned, and therefore that is goodness. So therefore it is good, right? which I think are the contentious, the contentious premises. Yeah, and also it's he gives a more precise argument that this being has to have all perfections. And the argument is um, it can't have, well, okay, since it's mm, it has no potentials, then it has no privations, which are absences of features that a thing naturally requires to be complete as the kind of thing that it is um and yeah apparently he thinks that if you have a privation then you have a potential an unrealized potential um and so you're not purely actual um but if you're imperfect then you must lack some feature that you require to be complete or perfect as the kind of thing that you are and so since a purely actual actualizer which we've established exists um would not have any 
it would not have any potential, then it won't have any privation either. Okay. Uh, how how big of a problem do you think this is for this argument? So the gap problem, I think it's a huge problem, but it would just take a very long time to explain how he fails to bridge the gap. Yeah, sure. Because he does put a lot of effort into bridging it. Um, and that's one thing that I would like to address in a series of videos separate from this. Yeah, question. I agree. Right. Yeah, there's quite a bit there. Um, I do think that even though there is a gap, the argument, at least if you got to that point, would be successful in that it would sort of refute a kind of naturalism, right? It would you would have to be some kind of theist, I think. Um, maybe not believer in the classical. I don't, I don't know, would you? So all we know is that it's an unmoved mover. So what's to say that this unmoved mover isn't a quantum vacuum. Hmm. You know what I mean? I, so I don't know. That's, that's the, 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 what's so interesting about the gap problem to me is asking those types of questions. What do, what, what, what does this conclusion really get us? Well, aren't what, there uh, fluctuations in a quantum vacuum? And would that mean that the vacuum moves or changes? Yeah. yeah. So maybe, so maybe the answer is there's that it's an infinite regress of moving. See what I mean? And so you, we would challenge this argument where it rules out that infinite regress. I'm just saying this is a potential. It's, it's not clear to me that if we accept the argument, the, the conclusion of this argument, that we are theists. That in the sense that we have to admit of a disembodied mind or a being that is worthy of our worship. Yeah. And uh, so we could say... Maybe there's the possibility of an infinite or beginningless hierarchical series. That's not saying it extends all the way back into time, but there there's, um, there's an infinite series of causes. Usually a hierarchical series just exists at one moment in time, I think. Um, and so then you would be questioning whether there even is a purely actual actualizer, because there could just be... Um, not purely actual actualizers. Yeah, just an infinite are, chain. Yeah, an infinite uh, chain of them. I think yeah. once you get down to that thing, you're no longer really accepting the argument. Um, yeah. You're, you're just objecting to certain premises or assumptions the argument makes. Um, it's separate from the gap problem. Yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do, we, where do we see this as a tool? So... This is a tool in the philosophy of religion. Fieser obviously is putting this forward in, in at least some sense as a response to new atheist arguments and skeptics of all varieties who say that God doesn't exist. He's saying that, no, this is, this is an argument. This is one that believers should use in defense of their beliefs. And, and, and how good of an argument do we think this is? Because for me, I think it's it's just another it's I put it right there with other cosmological arguments. I don't know if it gets us. It, does, it certainly doesn't get us what we want um, in, in the sense of, you know, the, the conclusion that we would like to get from an argument for the existence of God. This one seems outdated to me. This one seems uh, I guess I don't think too much of it. I, I probably think more of something like the Kalam because yeah. I is more updated uh, concepts, especially when it comes to cosmology. And I also think that the argument from contingency that was mentioned earlier is is better than this argument. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, so I guess it, the, the Thomas stuff always seems a bit weird to me, right? They, their obscurity, they almost see as a kind of strength in that the the normal refutations for arguments for the existence of God don't apply to them. Or they don't straightforwardly apply because it's so hard to interpret what they're saying in the first place and <laughs> make it clear that what you're saying applies. Yeah. Yes. And so, uh, yeah, it's more that it really hinges on this odd metaphysic and then convincing us that we have to accept that metaphysic is really where I think the work comes in, right? And 
it it just that metaphysic is so far removed from what is generally conceived of in modern times that like you said it feels outdated now of course they'll argue that it's not and that we're you know we really do need it but um, it, I think that's, it, that's why it comes off that way, at least, right? I think that I think that if we're going to have a conversation with a Thomas about something like that's where the conversation should spend a lot of its time. Yes, I think I think once you've accepted, it's almost like any any argument. Once you've accepted the base metaphysical premises, right? It's going to follow. Right? Mm-hmm. So it, once you're inside, or you've accepted the Thomistic metaphysic or the Neo Aristotelian metaphysic. This argument doesn't have any problems. You're going to object to it on the basis of the metaphysic it assumes, not really something within the argument itself, except for quite possibly the gap problem, as you mentioned, right? But you still get to a purely actual actualizer if you accept uh, change as the actualization of the potential, or at least that's how it seems to me. Do you guys agree? Yeah, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, but I wanted to mention another way that I think that this argument is inferior to, say, the Kalam and um, the yes. contingency argument. So I think that usually those are pretty clear and simple um, and not all that long. But this argument is so freaking long. It has 49 premises. And uh, I mean, that's when he goes to the trouble of laying it out formally in premise and conclusion form. Um, and even once he's done that, it's not clear that it's deductively valid because how are you going to make sure of that when it's so long, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but I do, I think I'm kind of optimistic that it can be presented in a valid form. This argu- argument probably can be made valid because a vast majority of arguments that people make can be made valid, I, I suppose. But then um, once you do make it valid, it might become more obvious that some of the premises are just really implausible. Yeah. So, so is the way of philosophy. (laughs) Okay. So, uh, I guess we can wrap it up there. That's been, I think that's been a pretty good conversation of at least his first argument. Um, so there's four other arguments and certainly much more that we can say about this one. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) We've, I, I, I hate to say, really only scratched the surface of Fieser's work here. Yeah, this is a very deep, uh, I mean, Thomistic and scholastic metaphysics and arguments for God's existence is its own special ball of wax that doesn't get a lot of attention. And there is 2,000 years of development. <laughs> that Why do you think on. it doesn't get so much attention these days? That's a, I guess that's an interesting question that maybe that's for another episode. Yeah, I mean, just the metaphysic has been, like you said, replaced by Galileo, then Newton, then Einstein. Um, All right. Well, guys, thanks for uh, discussing this argument with me today. And, uh, yeah, I will end it there. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you appreciate the tone and content of what Real Atheology has to offer, please consider writing a review for us on iTunes. All music was created by Work of Wolves. We here at Real A Theology would like to thank our Patreons. Kashi Savarina, Paul Pinos, Richard Kane, Lucas Stewart, Brandon McClarity, John Bain, Michael Tofsrud, Ro Wilms, Ed Atkinson, Kid Blokowski, Andrew Schneider, Jason McLuta, St. Nimbus, Bob April, and Alexander Songe. If you're interested in supporting Real Atheology, you can please come to our page at patreon.com slash realatheology.